the sun is energy and energy is life. How many million years ago did life begin? When did the first cell begin to move? How many waves have broken across the oceans since creatures developed organs for feeling, for seeing? How long ago did the first creature walk on Earth? How long is it since the advent of man? Throughout these millions of years, the Earth has received energy from the sun, life-giving energy, streaming to our world across 150 million kilometers of space, solar energy. The dream of harnessing the power of the sun is becoming reality. A solar furnace uses the focus of a giant mirror system to produce temperatures of thousands of degrees and can melt metals cleanly without the pollution which comes from the burning of coal or oil. Coal, oil and natural gas remain man's chief sources of energy. But the reserves are finite and must one day run dry. The world has an energy problem. At Aachen in West Germany, Philips Research Laboratories have built this experimental house to study non-polluting energy sources. At the heart of the experiment is a series of highly efficient solar collectors which absorb solar radiation and retain it by vacuum insulation and a heat reflecting filter. Each glass reflector tube, about one meter long, contains a blackened inner glass tube through which water is circulated and heated by solar energy. The hot water is pumped to heat exchangers in a storage tank where up to 12,000 kilowatt hours of energy can be stored. The Aachen experiment indicates that solar collectors are effective for hot water supplies and for operating refrigeration equipment and that they offer great hope in harnessing the power of the sun. But they are still in the research stage. The present practical reality is the solar cell, a wafer-thin slice of silicon, which can be transformed into a device which produces electric current from sunlight. This transformation calls for technology and equipment similar to that required to produce the tiny, reliable integrated circuits which made possible man's landing on the moon. It also calls for considerable capital investment. In South Australia, the Phillips Integrated Circuit Facility represents an investment of well over a million dollars. But it does enable Australia to manufacture solar cells, and because of this, to make a positive contribution to solving Australia's special energy needs. During the manufacturing process, the thin slice of ultra-pure silicon receives traces of other elements, traces as small as one part in a million. The diffusion furnaces operate at temperatures of 1200 degrees centigrade. Production takes place in rooms in which the air is filtered once every six seconds to remove any particle of dust larger than one three hundredth the diameter of a human hair. Even the protective clothing worn by the operators is washed inside the room in an automatic washing machine using specially purified water. This room is usually referred to as the yellow room because of the lighting, necessary because of the photographic processes involved in the manufacture of solar cells. Today's silicon solar cells are much more efficient than those first produced, 
but even so, only part of the solar radiation spectrum is suitable for conversion into electricity. Nevertheless, Telstar and other fixed position satellites, which now give worldwide communications, are powered by these cells, connected to form solar batteries. In addition to the extremely strict quality control in all stages of manufacture, each solar cell is individually tested before it is accepted. At Mount Tennant near Canberra, the Capital Territory Bushfire Brigade's radio is powered by solar cells. The lookout tower is isolated. The cost of installing power cables would be prohibitive, and in any case, they could be destroyed in a bushfire. Over. Control calling tenant. Go ahead. Tenant reporting smoke. A few hours sunlight provides enough power to charge the batteries for 24 hours. And the period of maximum sunshine, the summer, is also the period of maximum fire risk and radio usage. On the other side of the continent, off the West Australian coast, solar cells are being used to power radio transmitters in a number of buoys launched by the CSIRO. The buoys will float free in a study of ocean currents designed to help the $40 million rock lobster industry. The solar array on the top of each buoy generates the power for a transmitter which sends information to a Nimbus satellite. The satellite, which is also solar powered, transmits the signal to a ground station in the United States where the information is fed into a computer. The computer's output is received at the CSIRO's Fishery Division establishment at Cronulla in Sydney. And another computer produces a visual readout showing the course of each buoy. Currents charted far out to sea by using power from the sun. Maintaining batteries at full charge isn't only important in the world of science. It's important to people like boating enthusiast Lyle Perkins, who wants to find his houseboat ready to go when he drives from Melbourne to Eildon Weir on a holiday weekend. In the weeks between his visits, solar cells keep the batteries charged so he has no starting problems. And once on board, solar power provides the energy to produce music, light, and the other comforts that make life aboard a houseboat a pleasant and relaxing home away from home. Australia's most ambitious use of solar cells will result from three years of developmental work done by power engineers of Telecom Australia at their experimental field station at Maidstone, a Melbourne suburb. Telecom has decided to use solar power for a 580 kilometre trunk telephone system in the Northern Territory. It will be the first large capacity multiple solar cell power installation of its type in the world.
the type power plant consists of a 650 watt solar array mounted on a standard shipping container which houses batteries and control gear. There will be 13 of these between Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, providing the power for a microwave radio system with total capacity equivalent to nearly 3,000 telephone circuits. The microwave radio system will cater for telephone and telegraph demands and for television program relays in isolated areas where there is no reticulated power. In each container, there will be a large battery bank capable of storing 15 days reserve power. Telecom has been pursuing the development of solar power systems for more than four years and today has about 40 small installations powering telephone services in Australia's isolated outback. As a source of power, the solar cell has a number of advantages. There is a minimal need for maintenance. A solar installation can be left quite unattended. And there are no problems of pollution. The solar cell produces power from the sun. The solar cell is still relatively expensive compared with conventional energy. But telecom investigations have shown that solar power can be justified economically for such specialised applications as the Tennant Creek Alice Springs microwave radio system. Every day the earth absorbs a staggering amount of energy, energy that does not require mining or drilling. The annual bounty from the sun is equivalent to 50,000 times the electricity mankind will use in 50 years. So we have power to spare, power which we have only just begun to use, power without pollution. The great problem is how to harness the limitless energy from the greatest natural powerhouse, the sun. But harness this power we must, for the sun is energy, and energy is life.